San Diego, California, often known by its nickname, America's Finest City. For many, there was no moment finer than January 31st, 1988 at Jack Murphy Stadium. Here, under clear Southern California skies and the watchful eyes of a nation, Doug Williams became the first African-American quarterback to start a Super Bowl. For Williams, the seeds of the moment were planted in a much different time and place. When I was growing up, the Ku Klux Klan's and, and the voters' rights and civil rights was very much alive. I lived between two intersections, and uh, just about every Friday night, there was crosses burning on each end, because within those two intersections, uh, only black people lived in, those, in that area. My dad and a bunch of other guys would get in their cars, go and try to run the people off. Growing up in the South, in certain areas, was not good, and we knew the, the areas that you should not go into and we stayed our distance from those areas. When LSU played Ole Miss in Baton Rouge, we was not allowed to walk the street. It was important that we was not on the street because there was a whole lot of rebel flags coming through there, a lot of objects coming out of cars if you was walking the street. So, you know, our parents made sure uh, before the game and after the game that we was not allowed to walk the streets. As Williams learned his trade as a quarterback at Cheneyville High School in Cheneyville, Louisiana, he was a rarity. Black quarterbacks in 1970s college football were few and far between. And in the NFL, they were even more scarce. We could run a ball, we could tackle, but to think, to strategize, that was supposed to be for others. It was said that we didn't have the mental capabilities to be able to remember the plays. That was, you know, certainly the perception, you know, was, you know, how can he play quarterback? They're not smart enough, and that's, that's ridiculous. So that position of quarterback became very, very protected in the eyes of a lot of white people. Really to understand this, you have to understand America after World War II, uh, this period when football started to become really popular in America. Football had a lot of connotations that were connected with the military. And quarterback was the field general. He was in a very prominent leadership position. It was apparent that some people felt this leadership position didn't belong to a black person. The idea that a black guy couldn't lead men, nobody would follow him, and that he didn't have the smarts to learn a playbook. A lot of people in football and outside of football thought that this was true for a long time. We'll let you in the door. You can play certain positions, but there are certain positions that are only for those of us who can think, and you're not qualified. Throughout the 1960s, and into the following decade, the stereotype of black inferiority prevailed in business, in entertainment, and in the huddle, despite abundant evidence to the contrary. Sandy Stevens, quarterback, the Minnesota team to two Rose Bowl victories, the best quarterback, uh, certainly in the Big Ten, one of the best in the country. You had James Harris with the Rams. Touchdown! The Rams back out in front. You had Joe Gilliam. Here's Gilliam from the pocket, firing downfield. There goes Swan, puts it in with the five. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. Jefferson Street Joe Gilliam was the man. <laughs> I mean, he could, he could just flat throw it. And he did it with style. <laughs> he just had unbelievable style, man. The first breakthrough was Marlon Briscoe. Born in California, he came of age in Nebraska, and in 1968 became the first black starting quarterback in the NFL's modern era. Marlon was uh, small in size, but had tremendous quarterback skills. Could throw the ball, had a tremendously great arm, had a fine stride for running the ball as well. I've been a uh, so-called black first black quarterback on every level, from Pop Warner League, to junior high school, to high school, to college. I never considered myself a black quarterback. I considered myself a quarterback. 
The Broncos' biggest crowd pleaser of 1968 was rookie Marlon Briscoe. A quarterback in college, Briscoe was only 5'9", so the Broncos moved him to the defensive secondary. But in the home opener, Lou Saban ran out of quarterbacks. Briscoe got the call and became the AFL's first black quarterback. I just went out there and really played sandlot football, uh, you know, and played the way I uh, had always played. Moved the chain, uh, scrambled out of danger. I knew that the world would be looking at me, but I didn't dwell on it. Well, you have to remember, this is 1968. My entire line was white. They were from the South, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. And prior to coming into the pros, not only had they not played with a black quarterback, they hadn't played with any black players, period. They stood by me and played for me. They would always have the same. Don't let them touch the magician. Briscoe's teammates may have been more progressive than their times, but the Broncos would ultimately cut him loose. I knew that if I was going to remain in the National Football League, that I would have to uh, change position. I called Buffalo. I called a lot of teams that I, I had had success against. And uh, Buffalo coach uh, John Rouse said, well, we, we look at you as a receiver, uh, but not as a quarterback. Briscoe's quarterback dream was dead, but he had opened a door. There was upheaval in the NFL and beyond. A lot of things were happening in, in this country. In 1968, we had the Vietnam War, we had John Carlos and Tommy Smith giving the black power sign. Our leaders were getting gunned down, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy. 1968 seemed to be the year of change. The coming decade would be a time of complete transformation. The struggles of the civil rights movement were beginning to bear fruit. As this tumultuous world turned all around him, especially in his native south, Doug Williams left Zachary in 1973 and enrolled at Grambling State University. There were certain schools that had a tradition of producing tremendously talented individuals. And those schools got a reputation. There was a tremendous pride if you were a Morehouse man, if you played football at Gremlin, Florida A&M. Black ball players from predominantly black schools have made a tremendous impact on the National Football League. I can take a team of the greatest players in historically black colleges, I'll put that team on the field against any team. You don't want Jerry Rice and Walter Payton on your team, really? Because I'll take them. And, you know, I, I can take a team of just historically black college players and I would feel that team in their prime against any team that's ever lived. If you look back at uh, the conference in which I played in the SWAC, SWAC, we had some great guys, Kenny Houston, Otis Taylor, Shaq Harris. I think it was a tremendous pipeline. Into that pipeline went a promising quarterback prospect from Zachary, Louisiana. In 1973, Doug Williams enrolled at Grambling State University but it wasn't his first choice. <laughs> he didn't really want to decide that, you know. I said, no, you're going to Grambling. Eddie Robinson had, had a lot to do with everybody being here, but one night, Coach Rob called late, and I was asleep, and uh, my mom came in and shook me, and she said, hey, I, I'm on the phone with Coach Robinson. I just want to let you know you're going to Grambling. So I looked at her, I said, how am I going to Grambling? He, she said, because he said you going to church and you was going to graduate, and uh, the rest is history. His impact was immediate. Williams quickly established himself as one of the nation's best college quarterbacks, as a scrambler, as a passer, and most critically, as a leader. Doug was almost a legend down there in that area uh, for the things he did as a quarterback. Touchdown! Touchdown! What a great throw, what a great catch! He was leading Grambling to uh, great fortunes. Eddie Robinson has spoken about him and said that he's one of the greatest quarterbacks in college football. My father never really wanted his quarterbacks to run. Before he got his knee hurt, he was not only a great passer, but pretty good scrambler at his size. I saw him play twice in college and 
watching him reminded me almost of Archie Manning. I played a wing T. And if you know anything about a wing T, that's two tight ends and a wing back. And um, my senior year, I, you know, I had 8,400 yards. I was an all-time leading passer, had the most TDs in one season. Wide open offense just blew everything out the water. At the heart of Grambling's success was the relationship between the quarterback and the man who had built the program. Unfortunate that a lot of people, uh, and especially a lot of African-American kids, uh, did not get an opportunity to know Eddie Robinson. You missed the treat. He was well thought of and very admired by everyone. Matter of fact, Coach Rob came to my high school, Westside, and tried to recruit me to come to Grambling to play football. Eddie Robinson is probably the most underrated coach of any sport in America, in the history of American sports. Eddie Robinson is now being forgotten, which is shameful. As a man, as a human being, as a motivator, as a mentor, I don't think you can get any better than that. It wasn't about the X's and the O's, it was more about the Joe's. Despite Williams' impressive college career, including a fourth place Heisman finish in 1977, Quarterback products from the Southwest Athletic Conference weren't exactly rocketing up NFL draft boards. But a little further south in Tampa, someone had taken notice. When that draft class was coming out, Coach McKay said, hey, look, I think I need to send you over to Grambling, and I want you to do some research on this quarterback over there. I can remember Coach Gibbs calling and saying that he wanted to come down and, and uh, spend a day. With, with me. I went over, spent two days with him. You know, he'd take me to McDonald's. We came back and we talked football. We got on the board. You put him on the board to talk about things. Just had a great conversation. The Bucks may have shown interest, but Williams was feeling doubt. Coach Rob and I talked a lot. And um, what I really wanted to do in life was to be a high school coach. I wanted to be like my brother. And I told Coach Rob, I said, Coach, if, if I don't get drafted within the third round, I think I'm going to go and coach high school football. And coach looked at me and said, hell, Cat, you can't do that. Hell, you got to go whenever they call you. It was time for fate to play its hand in the life of Doug Williams. On May 2nd, 1978, in the first round of the NFL draft, history called. They were, wasn't like the parties they have today. They certainly weren't invited to New York and uh, didn't have a, a whole lot of people around me. Matter of fact, I was here in school at the complex on draft day just waiting for the phone call. When I first saw Doug in Grambling, there's this big six foot four, 220 pound quarterback. I mean, he can throw the ball all over the place. That's when I recognized the ability right there that, hey, this guy could probably help you win and take you to a championship. Up until that point, there had never been a black quarterback taken in the first round. Coach McKay deserves a lot of credit for that. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, first round selection, having acquired the choice in a trade from Houston. Quarterback, Doug Williams of Grambling. We made the trade with the Houston Oilers, and we got the 17th pick in the draft. I was almost positive that he would be there. I didn't think anybody would take, as in those days, a black quarterback in the first round. After I picked him, I got a call from, from Bart Starr, and Bart Starr told me, great pick. After I heard that, I really felt good. But those good feelings didn't last, as Williams soon became embroiled in a drawn-out contract dispute. When the stalemate finally ended, he found himself under the tutelage of the Tampa assistant coach who had scouted him at Grambling, Joe Gibbs. When I got in, Joe Gibbs took me home with him every single night. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to his wife, Pat, his son, J.D., and his son, Carl, because I took up a lot of their time, time that he probably would have been spending with them. Joe Gibbs spent with me to get me up to stuff with the uh, playbook. Adapting to the Tampa playbook was one thing, but adapting to the city itself in the late 1970s was quite another. Tampa, obviously a southern, southern town. Playing in Tampa was like playing in any part of the South. It's way below the Mason-Dixon line where I played. That's where I got a lot of mail that I thought was inappropriate. I got a box once with, um, with a rotten watermelon, and they, they say throw it, to, throw it to them ends, 
the N word, maybe they catch that. You know, stuff like that you, you, you had to deal with. And I, and I got to the conclusion, anytime I got a letter with no return address, I realized that some coward was sending me some derogatory mail, and, and I just threw it in the trash can. Aiding Williams' transition was the head coach who had taken a chance on him, an iconoclast among his peers in the coaching ranks, John McKay. I think he viewed Doug as a son. With Doug, I think he was driven in trying to make sure that uh, he was given every opportunity to be a really successful person. John McKay, man. People don't know this. Uh, Jimmy Jones was John McKay quarterback in 1969. And at that time, you didn't find a lot of African-American quarterbacks playing at the major university. Coach McKay was, was colorblind when it came to football players. John McKay wanted the best player on the football team. You know, he used to call me Dougie. You know, he said, don't worry about it, Dougie. It's going to be all right. Despite McKay's support, there were growing pains on the field and beyond. He came into a situation that wasn't easy. Number one, the franchise had not been very good. We lost 26 games in a row the two years before he got there. Number two, uh, Tampa was still more of a southern city than it probably uh, is today. And, and there was no question that there was a focus on the fact that Doug was an African-American or, as in those days, a black quarterback. Rookie year was a little tough because I got my job broke early in the season. For seven and a half weeks, I was wide shut. I ended up playing the last football game of the year against the New Orleans Saints. So we got through the rookie year. We won five games. We had won more games in one year than they had won in the first two years. Doug, to me, was always defined by his rookie year, 1978. Broke his jaw that year, played with his jaw wired shut, and wanted no credit for it. He was the ultimate tough guy. The last game that strike year was the ninth game, and we had to win the game to get into the playoffs. Doug was injured before the game. He had a slight hamstring on, on his left leg. He had some bo loose bone chips on his right knee. We took the opening drive to about their five-yard line, and uh, he throws a slant pass, and just as he gets ready to throw a dent or somebody like that, hit him in the back, the ball went flying. He's laying there on the ground, one of those big tackles, picked it up and started running for a touchdown. Doug rolls out from underneath that guy and starts chasing him down the field, dragging his leg behind him, slowly closing the gap. He finally caught him about the five-yard line and body slammed him. Defense went in and stopped him, and they kicked the field goal. And then we kicked the field goal in the last play of the game to tie them and went on and won the game in overtime. To me, it was like a million-dollar play. Not many quarterbacks would roll out after getting hit like that with two bad legs and chase a guy 90 yards. He knew the game. He was a leader. Uh, when you were asking a, a guy that's going to run your team, he better be a leader. He played the game in a way where it wasn't always right. It wasn't always pretty. Sometimes the balls were high. Sometimes he would get out of sorts and throw some interceptions early. But he was a winner, and he always gave you that feeling of game wasn't over. We're still in it. We got Doug, and they don't. Williams will try to pass on first down. Let's one fly. Long, he's got House open. He's got it. Touchdown, Buccaneers. Kevin House from Doug Williams, and the Bucks have the lead. His leadership and intangible were matched only by his pure physical talent. He had a great vision of the field. I've never seen anybody could throw a ball with little effort like he could. He had an extraordinarily strong arm, could, at the flick of a wrist, sling it. <laughs> 65, 70 yards. <laughs> this is a guy that he'd come off the bus and throw strikes. He didn't need any warm-up pitches. When he was young, he'd throw some balls. Everything was a... I mean, he let that thing go, and you see other players would go, good gosh, did you see that? <laughs> I mean, he could throw that thing like you wouldn't believe. My first day or so on job here, I, I came in the office, and some of the players were around and he happened to be in the office. I mean, he was 6'5", about 225 or 30 pounds with no fat. I asked one of the secretaries, I said, who's that? And they says, that's Doug Williams, our quarterback. I says, that's our quarterback? What do the rest of these guys look like? In 1979, a franchise that had only known losing suddenly found itself in uncharted but exciting territory. The first game of the year, I'll never forget it. We played the Detroit Lions and uh, Doug threw a touchdown pass sitting on his rear end. I just knew that the football guys were with us. We're on our way. We won that first game, as the song goes, 
Ain't no stopping us now. We're on the move. The high point in Tampa was in 1979 when we was able to um, go to the playoffs and uh, we upset the Philadelphia Eagles who nobody gave us an opportunity to win. Defensively, uh, I think we wound up number one. Offensively, we did some great things. Uh, we used to tell Doug, hey Doug, give us, give us 10. He said, 10? Shoot, I'll give you 30. If <laughs> we give you 40 if I can. And that's what we needed. After three or four years of being ridiculed and laughed at, it was time. Touchdown! Touchdown! Touchdown, Buccaneers! Doug came into his own. He struggled the first year a little bit. But the second year, here was an expansion franchise going all the way to the NFC Championship game. And we were nine points away from being in the Super Bowl. The Bucks lost the game, but they had gained respect across the league. And the word about their quarterback began to spread. The most promising development for Doug Williams in this period had nothing to do with football, but the marriage of his college sweetheart, Janice. I used to go to the library when I was a freshman. Every night I used to read the um, Baton Rouge newspaper. You know, I was missing home. Every night I go in there and this young lady was sitting in there doing her homework. And I say to myself, I like her. And uh, I eventually pushed myself to go sit at her table and had an opportunity to walk her to the dorm. And, and from there, you know, a relationship was born. Janice did not know I even played football. We was playing Tennessee State and um, the starting quarterback got hurt and I came in and finished the game and uh, her and her friends was walking past the dressing room after the game and I came out the dressing room and her mouth flew wide open and she said, I didn't know you played football and uh, we just went from there. I remember when he called and told me he's deciding to get married and he was so excited, he was in love. I actually got married my last year in Tampa, which we were together for nine years before I got married. So um, it was easy. It was an easy call. After, after nine years, somebody better ask somebody something. <laughs> this period would soon be marked by another life-defining highlight, the birth of his daughter, Ashley. With Janice and Ashley by his side, Doug Williams' future in Tampa was filled with promise. But a lifetime of challenges could not have prepared him for what was ahead. It was right off the Eastern National had been born, so they brought her down to see us. We had went shopping and we had to come back home because she had a terrible headache. So we said we'd go back the next day. So that morning she woke up with a headache. And Doug come in the room and woke me up and said, come in here with Janice, you got a headache. So I went on, got up, I went on up in the bathroom with her and she was crying. And I said, why are you crying? She looked at me, she said, my dear, will you take care of my baby? You know, and I thought funny when she asked me that. I said, yeah, you know I'll take care of the baby. And Doug left with her. They went on to the doctor. Doug called me and I said, I'm on my way down there. He said, man, there's not a need to come. I said, why not? He said, Janice just passed. So it was a sad moment for all of us. Janice uh, was once in a lifetime type of individual. She died at, when I was three months, so I didn't know her. Sometime. I remember sometimes growing up, I would have these moments, like if I would be in my room by myself and a song would come on or something, I would just start crying and I would, it would be mommy moments. I miss the moments of not being able to have those motherly moments with my mom. I can remember Ashley and I used to be driving and traveling somewhere and um, I would look over and tears would be running out of her eyes, and I said, what's wrong? And then she look at me and she say, I was just thinking about my mom. That hits you in the heart because you're talking about a young lady who didn't even know her mom, but she can feel her mom. As Doug Williams coped with the unthinkable at home, he was dealt another major setback, this time in his professional life. 
His career should never come to an end in Tampa Bay. We were going through negotiations with Doug, and I don't blame him. He was the lowest paid quarterback in the National Football League. He was one of the better ones and should have been paid like one of the better ones. In 1982, there was only um, 28 football teams in the uh, National Football League. I was the uh, 54th highest paid quarterback with only 28 teams. I think it's evident the reason why I was the 54th uh, lowest paid quarterback, the highest paid quarterback ever one you want to say. I was told, okay, we're going to trade for Jack Thompson. I was jumped out of the seat. I said, Jack Thompson? I said, he can't even play. My dad clearly, as far as Buccaneers go, did not get over it. He had built something that he thought was in a good place, and instantly it was a problem. It put a stain on the franchise that the franchise didn't recover from until 1997. And that's a pretty incredible thing because that's 15, 16 years later. Prior to Doug Williams, Tampa Bay was a laughing stock in the league. I can remember being there when we were 0-26. Three out of the four years he was there, we're in the playoffs. Doug put Tampa Bay's name on the map. 1984, Doug Williams found himself out of the NFL and in a renegade new league, the USFL. Around him, the country was going through a transformation from politics to pop culture. Attitudes toward race were changing. In the league he left behind, another evolution was taking place at the quarterback position. Over the 1980s, the passing game became the prevailing winning strategy in professional football. Sacking the quarterback and the numbers of sacks became tremendously important because the quarterback was the key athlete in the sport. This put a premium on escapability. All of a sudden you had a proliferation of black quarterbacks who had that escapability factor. What I'm saying is that it was Lawrence Taylor, Reggie White, Charles Haley, Chris Dolman who gave us the black quarterback just as surely as the lion gave the antelope his speed. I think once we got to the 80s, especially for the National Football League, we were getting into a different type of individual who was running the football teams, who was coaching the football teams, and, and wasn't really caught up on the good old boy network. You had a bunch of people who did not care what color the individual was as long as they can get the job done. In 1986, the USFL closed its doors, rendering jobless an entire league of talented players. Among them was Doug Williams. But when his NFL hopes began to drift once again, he received a lifeline, thanks in part to a cruel twist of fate. First and ten, Riggins, Squeeze Licker, back to Theismann. Theismann's in a lot of trouble. And it was Lawrence Taylor who slammed Theismann to the ground at the 42-yard line. The blitz was on. That's not necessarily a good play to have called. And quickly, Lawrence Taylor was up saying Theismann is hurt. And I don't believe Lawrence Taylor would have reacted that way unless Theismann is really hurt. At that particular time, Jay Schrader was the only quarterback that had any playing time, I think, on the Washington Redskins roster. Joe Gibbs called me and he said, Douglas, Joe Gibbs, hey coach, how you doing? He said, just calling because Bobby Beffley wanted to know, could you come and play back up quarterback for us? And I laughed at coach. I said, coach, at this particular time, I can play any up you want me to play because I don't have a job. <laughs> I can still remember having the discussions and Mr. Cook is going, what? That amount of money for a backup quarterback? Joe always felt the most important position on a football team was a quarterback, and the second most important position was the backup quarterback, because if, if you don't have a good backup quarterback, your season's over at that point. Williams had feared his career was over, but suddenly he found himself on a roster in a city full of promise. It was a fun city. It was always something happening, always energetic. D.C. is the epitome of what's actually going on. It's Chocolate City. Chocolate City? D.C. was Chocolate City, for real, in the mid-'80s. It's a place of vibrant African-American uh, life, but on the other hand, it also showed some of the pathologies that were going on within the black community. You have the crack epidemic sweeping through Washington, D.C. 
you have basically, you know, two Washingtons. You have the political Washington, which is, you know, basically white, and then you have black Washington. When they shoot the camera at Washington, D.C., they always shoot it at the Capitol, but they never turn it around to show black D.C., and that's two different worlds. Washington is a city divided by race, and the racial divide was reflected in the city's NFL franchise, one that was infamously the last to integrate and was ruled by the iron fist of George Preston Marshall. This man who owned that team was playing racial, racist games like never before. George Preston Marshall vowed to never have a, a African-American player on his football team. He was an outspoken racist that had to acquiesce and take Bobby Mitchell. Redskins had a tradition of the welcome home luncheon. At one point in the program, everybody stood up and started singing. I wish I was in Dixie. Who? I said, what the heck? <laughs> Mr. Marshall was sitting behind me, and this big voice boomed out, sing, Mitchell, sing! I don't know that people outside of Greater Washington and people with no ties to the Redskins understood that Robert Kennedy essentially threatened the owner, the then owner of the Washington Redskins, to integrate his team or get the hell out of what was called D.C. Stadium. Get out. Bobby Mitchell was basically ordered. I mean, this was desegregation, ordered desegregation. In the Redskins fight song, the, the lyric, which is now fight for old D.C., was fight for old Dixie. I mean, it was just short of having the rebel flag. The Redskins may have had a checkered past, but for Doug Williams in 1986, the present meant opportunity and the chance to reconnect with an instrumental figure in his career. I knew he was going back to Joe Gibbs because Joe's the one that helped me bring him into the National Football League. He was the one that tutored him the first year. He's the one that helped develop Doug Williams into what he was. He's the one, when he took him in, believed that he had to play him, Doug would win, and Doug would win big for him. Doug Williams arrived in Washington and right into the middle of a quarterback controversy. He began there as a backup, and his playing time was unpredictable. But he had every intention of winning the starting job at the expense of the incumbent, Jay Schrader. Jay and I didn't have a relationship. I don't know whether Jay had a relationship with anybody else in the locker room. Jay was a little different. The differences between the two quarterbacks became clearer as the 1987 season wore on. And in the last week of the regular season, the quarterback controversy was settled definitively. It was a decision that would steer the course of the postseason and history. We're playing in Minnesota. It's the last game of the season. And Jay Schrader is not playing well in the first half. We put Doug in the second half, come back, and win the game. And at that point, the coaches decided that even though Schrader had started more games and won more games, that Doug Williams was the right guy at that point in time. Joe's post-game interview, he announced that particular time that Doug Williams was going to be a starting quarterback in the playoffs. When you think about it in retrospect, that was a huge gamble. But it wasn't a gamble in the locker room. We were all for it. It was exciting to get Doug in there. And I was on the practice squad with Doug, and so we had a great connection. I could look at him in the eyes and know what he wanted me to do. It was exciting. Our offensive line, we just wanted somebody to drive the car. I mean, we knew we could run block. We knew we could pass block. Just get into the car, do the things you need to. I had a veteran football team that didn't react to the city. They all had enough respect for Joe Gibbs. When he made a decision, that's the decision that we had to live with. The Redskins opened the playoffs against the Bears, only two years removed from their own Super Bowl title and whose monsters of the midway defense still terrorized the league. But Washington was playing with some added inspiration. San Francisco was the top seed. They get beat by Minnesota. So now we know if we win the game against the Bears, we're home for the championship game. Everybody felt to a man we would not lose at RFK in the championship game. We're at frigid Soldier Field in Chicago for the NFC Divisional Playoff game. 
Chicago, frigid Chicago. That was the coldest game that I'd ever played in. It is a brutally cold Chicago Sunday afternoon in January. One of their coaches said something to one of our assistant coaches during pregame warm-up that uh, they thought that they would have the Giants instead of us. So they were surprised that we even got through the first round. That was Mike Dicker. He had his crew there. Those people was doing their dance. And lo and behold, the Washington Redskins had arrived. We was going to make sure that we wanted to play the last game at Soldier Field. The Redskins' confidence was quickly shaken when the Bears roared out to an early 14-0 lead. But of course, Washington's leader was well versed in the art of the comeback. We fell behind 14 to nothing, but we fought back. They show him blitz again. He's got Didier, touchdown. We clawed back and we put ourselves in position to win. Darrell Green had a miraculous punt return where he hurdled the defender, got hurt, tore rib cartilage, and as he's running into the end zone, he's holding the rib cartilage. Breaks it to the near side, 25. Watch out to the 20. Near side, 10. He's gone. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. Darrell Green returns the punt 50 yards. We end up leaving Chicago with a win. Their reward was a trip home and an NFC Championship showdown with the Minnesota Vikings. That was a tough game, but we prevailed and we came through. We found a way on fourth and goal The Darrell Green knocked the ball away from little Darrell Nelson, and we realized we were going to the Super Bowl. An improbable season had taken another incredible turn, and for Doug Williams, a lifelong dream was within reach. The mountaintop was near. The sun may have been shining when the Redskins arrived in San Diego for Super Bowl XXII, but there were dark clouds ahead in the form of the two-time AFC champion Denver Broncos and league MVP John Elway. We were favored to win the game. That's first of all. No one really gave the Redskins a chance to win that game. It was so much made of John Elway. But everybody was hyped up on John Elway. By the time of that Super Bowl, all you could hear about was the Elway cross. John Elway throwing the ball so hard that he left the cross in between the chest of his receivers. And I'm like, people forgot they were saying these same things about Doug Williams back in the 70s. Although Elway was the main attraction, Doug Williams and the color of his skin was the marquee story. Some people didn't really know how to actually deal with the situation, particularly when it came to the media. How long have you been a black quarterback? How long have you been a black quarterback? Doug, how long have you been a black quarterback? Doug said, well, I've been a quarterback for about 10 years. I've been black all my life. I just thought, you know, how ridiculous some of the things that are written. We had all these people converging on this story. And Doug Williams was the guy. He, had, he was the guy to handle it. How many times can you answer, how does it feel to be the first black quarterback to start a Super Bowl? We didn't care if Doug was black, if he was red, if he was yellow. We just wanted the guy that was going to lead our football team. It was big, certainly talked about, but I think that storyline is only as big as the player that's in focus makes it. And Doug didn't make it a big focus. Joe Gibbs, Bob Bam, Jack King Cook didn't bring Doug Williams to San Diego to, to show off a black quarterback. Uh, we know why we came here. We came here to work hard and win the Super Bowl. It may not have been a point of emphasis for Williams, but his skin color had major implications in the African-American community. Everybody was paying attention to the game. They understood the significance. You did feel like this was a big, big moment, not only for Doug, but for those that were going to come behind him. You kind of understood that if he won, it would probably create opportunities for others. The anticipation was huge. Doug Williams' success or failure is going to have ramifications on future black quarterbacks. So now with Doug Williams in the Super Bowl, and this may be fair or unfair, you have this burden on your shoulders. We need you to not only perform, but we need you to excel. Good afternoon from Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego, California. The road to Super Bowl 22 stops right here. Williams' personal road had taken him to difficult places, but he had persevered. And now it had delivered him to the grand stage. If you're a competitor, one of the greatest moments is to be able to have that opportunity to run out on the field of competition and to know that the biggest game of that year, the Super Bowl, you got an opportunity to play in it. That's, that's one of those feelings that um, make your gut wrench a little bit. From Grambling, quarterback, number 17, Doug Williams. Running out of the chutes, of one of those blooms was probably the greatest moment of my life. But when the game itself began, 
the dream quickly turned into the Redskins' nightmare. Well, the game started out, it was going to be all Denver. We got off to a horrible start. The first offensive play for the Bronco touchdown to Ricky Natil. Elway going for the bomb, right at the asset, throws caught by Natil, touchdown! We went down 10 to nothing to Elway. You could sense a little apprehension at that point, a little nervousness, because we had lost the last Super Bowl we were into the Raiders, and ultimately that wasn't a very close game. Oh, I'm thinking it's about to be a blowout, because you know it's John Elway. Eight years old watching John Elway play. I thought he was just the best quarterback ever to play the game. Nothing's going right. When they scored that 10 points, I was like, wow, they finna blew us out of here. Everybody's attitude was like, oh, man, we about to get drowned. For Williams and the Redskins, things went from bad to potentially disastrous. On first and 10, slipping down is Williams, and he's hurt. Did you see him twist his leg when he went down? I went back to pass. My right foot just kept going back and uh, ended up hyperextending my left knee. I was really concerned that, oh, no, Doug, you get all the way here to the Super Bowl, and now you're going to have to watch the rest of the game on the bench. When he got banged up early in that game, part of me was like, oh, my God, this is, can't happen, this can't happen. Williams hyperextended his knee. You thought, oh, my gosh, he's going to be out of the game entirely. I remember vividly on the sidelines, the trainers were working with him, and he was still sort of hobbling around grimacing. I started telling Jay to get warmed up because I felt like he's going to come out. As a matter of fact, I may have even sent Jay in there. Schrader comes in. I'm like, oh, wow. Is Doug going to even get back in the game? The pain. The doubt. The Super Bowl dream slipping away. It was all a warm-up act for one of the most astonishing feats the sport had ever seen. The first quarter of Super Bowl XXII had seen the Broncos jump out to a 10-0 lead and the Redskins quarterback, Doug Williams, sidelined with a leg injury. But as the second quarter began, Washington still had reason to believe. Meanwhile, Williams up and walking around, trying to work it out. I was just hoping with all my heart that he would be able to come back into the game. If you knew the relationship between Jay Schrader and Doug Williams, if Doug could walk, he was gonna come back into that game. Before I went back in, Joe Gibbs came to me and he said, Doug, is you ready to go? I said, yeah, coach, I'm ready to go. And I can remember him saying, okay, guys, we're going to get this sucker to rolling. The Washington Redskins offense is back on the football field, and so is number 17, Doug Williams. Never one to gingerly ease his way back, Williams decided to immediately take a shot. I looked out there at Doug, and I saw right away underneath the center, and they pressed Ricky Sanders. Defensive back come up on me and Doug audible to a deep pass. I went, he's going to take a shot here. Play action fake. Williams going up top. Got Sanders on the fly at midfield. He's gone unless they can catch him. The 30, the 20, the 15, the 10. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. Just like that. It was almost like the second he came back, it was on. Williams for Clark. Fake this time, faked out everybody. He's got Sanders in the clear at the 10. In the end zone, he's got Didier. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. This was a fight, they might stop it. We are seeing a virtuoso performance. That's the most perfect quarter of football ever played in the history of the game. People in football talk about the drive, the catch. For Redskins fans, what they remember about the 1988 Super Bowl is the quarter. The Redskins were red hot. Doug Williams couldn't miss. They just went down the field and went bang, 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 bang. You don't overcome 35 points uh, you know, very easily in a Super Bowl. Literally in about a 20-minute span, the game went from 10 to nothing, Denver, to 35-10, us. Game over. An unbelievable second quarter. The Redskins had stormed their way to a Super Bowl record 35 points in one quarter. The eye of the storm was Doug Williams. His form, his style, his release. Doug was textbook. What Doug was able to accomplish in that second quarter, I don't think will ever be done again. It was very uh, exciting to see. At the same time, uh, it was surprising. I was stunned by it. I think we were all stunned. It probably was as good a 15 minutes as anybody has ever played the game at that position. Doug Williams on that day seemed to be the quintessential passer. That's part of the pride that went into the day for black people. He wasn't pulling off 35-yard runs. He was beating 
them at their game, if you will. I really got teared up when he became the MVP of the ball game. I knew the accomplishment he made was just huge for all of us. The first black quarterback to start a Super Bowl, the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl, now let's end it forever. When I was walking off the field, I thought I had done what uh, Martin Luther King used to always say, uh, get to the mountaintop. I thought I had reached the mountaintop of, of my profession. Uh, you can't go no higher. He had reached the pinnacle, and his impact would have a reach far beyond that night and the confines of Jack Murphy Stadium. Super Bowl 22 opened up a lot of eyes, not for people in the African-American community, but just all around the world. The most significant part is the fact that he was the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl and the only. It shows you that, you know, we can do things that other people think we can't. The great thing about sports is it's so merit-based that if you're good, you make it. If you're good, you make it all the way to the top. And so what previously were barriers or glass ceilings that could exist in another line of work gets shattered. You can chalk up another one for sports for breaking another barrier. And what I remember most is the end of the game. They're walking off the field and Doug took his helmet and he held it up above his head. To win and to win in that fashion and then to walk off the field with his helmet held high, all the haters had to bite their tongue that day. May I say to you, sir, I think you have handled your personal week of history nobly. Well, you know, the thing I had to say to myself, first of all, I didn't come here with the Washington Redskins as a black quarterback. I came here as the quarterback of the Washington Redskins and to play a football game to win it. Doug Williams had reached the pinnacle of the game, but the pain he fought through in Super Bowl XXII soon became too much to bear. Less than two years after his landmark win, his career ended. But his true impact had only just begun. It's recent enough where young black quarterbacks right down through Cam Newton and Robert Griffin III, I think they know. I think if Doug Williams walks in the room, they know. Because even if they're not old enough to remember the game, or they weren't even born yet like, like RG3, their daddies knew and their uncles knew. They know this is the guy. The things that he was able to accomplish in the game, the things he was able to do and open up doors, gave me a lot of confidence playing the quarterback position. I was in college at the time, playing quarterback at USC. To see him go out and do what he did, not just do what he did, not just win the game, but dominate the game, it showed to me that now, finally, hopefully, that stigma of a black NFL quarterback being successful is totally over was kind of saying, we can do it. Just give us a chance. And now we see uh, great kids getting the opportunity to play. And I say that as someone who didn't have to fight to make it, but who truly saw the struggle. They broke a lot of barriers as far as Afro-American kids dreaming to play the quarterback position. We have an, an opportunity to play the position like any other quarterback, whether you're black, blue, red, white, or green. For every Michael Vick and Vince Young and Cam Newton, Robert Griffin III, all of those guys have to pay homage to what Doug Williams was able to accomplish. The landscape of the NFL is totally different. Doug was a part of that and part of history. It was also a triumph for those closest to Williams who had always believed in him. Men like John McKay and Eddie Robinson. He never would have missed that game. He told me that that was one of the happiest moments um, in his life. He was happy for him, probably a little more emotional a week or two later, because I remember we were at dinner and talking about it. He got emotional, which is very unusual for the coach. But I think he was just very happy for Doug because, you know, again, we saw the rise, we saw the fall, and you didn't have that feeling that Doug was going to come back on the scene. It just, you never had that that impression and for him to do that and do it then on the biggest stage and win the biggest game is really impressive. Doug was that right guy to win that Super Bowl. Coming from a historically black university, Doug's coach, one of the greatest football coaches of football has ever seen at any level. It just was the right story and the right guy for that story. A story and a milestone. And perhaps somewhere in the march of history, a stepping stone. In terms of leadership, how far you can soar. Before, there could be a black president or there had to be a black quarterback. You can't underestimate 
the fact that it took a Doug Williams in sports, Michael Jackson in entertainment, Oprah Winfrey on TV, to get America's comfort level to where they could deal with a black president. People grow in incremental steps, and you just don't go from back of the bus to the Oval Office. You need steps along the way, and a big step was Doug Williams. The legacy of Doug Williams is profound and vast. Stretching from the quarterback ranks of the NFL to the way we see race in America. That legacy now includes two sons, one by blood, a namesake at Grambling, where Williams has returned as head coach, and another, a spiritual one, in Washington, D.C. Scrambles up the middle, breaks the tackle. He's to the 30, 35, 40, up the sideline, 50, RG3, electrifying all the way into the end zone. Can you believe it? I think I'd be lying if I said there was no added pressure being an African-American quarterback because there is. And uh, that's something that you just got to approach the way you can. You can't try to fight that battle on your own. Doug Williams being the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl, it gives you that extra strength to feel like you can go out and do the same. I always played quarterback. I started playing quarterback in the ninth grade. I just, I loved it because I, I love touching the ball that we play. He's a great dad, man. We, we talk, if you hear us talk, you will laugh, man. We talk like, like friends, like brothers. We have a lot of fun together. I used to go to school and I used to see people do black history reports on him, uh, just talk about him, how, how good he was and how great that game was. And it just, it just made me proud as, as a young boy, just, Walking around, I always wanted to be like my dad. DJ Williams is just one of many who grew up admiring and trying to emulate the path set by Doug Williams. Walking in that path means understanding that what happens on the field is only a small fraction of what defines success. What defines a man? But what happens on that field? can also resonate far beyond, as was the case on a clear San Diego night 25 years ago. No matter what color you are, the most important thing is opportunity. If you get an opportunity, you got a chance to make something happen.